know that two weeks from today, we will dedicate a good portion of our worship service to uh, honor our sweet sister Denise, that in such a short time had such a powerful impact on all of us. For those of you that are new and don't know uh, about the situation, it was uh, only a year and a half ago that on Thanksgiving Day, when Rick and Denise moved to Queen Valley, uh, I think he went online and bought a house online. <laughs> Didn't really know where he was going. <laughs> Showed up here. We had a wedding ceremony on Thanksgiving Day. And uh, she grabbed our hearts. Shortly afterwards, began battling cancer again. We saw her be healed of cancer in her lungs, only for it a few months later to reappear in her brain. And God was at work through all of this. Uh, this isn't the outcome that I was hoping for. And I'll save some thoughts for two weeks from today. Those of you who would like to share an experience or like to share something about Denise, uh, two weeks from today, we will take whatever time we need. And uh, we'll put some pictures up. And we will rejoice together for our loss. It's pretty selfish. Rick, I, I still wish he was here battling cancer and with us. <laughs> it's pretty, that's pretty damn selfish of me. Can I just tell you that? Okay, it is. But see, God's up to something. And if I offended your religion by that, get over yourself, okay? We're not planning on being here. This is real. This is real life, folks. We're not here wearing some mask like many of us have been trained. This is real life and things hurt. And our hearts hurt. But we have confidence in what God is doing. Amen. And what a relief for her. Yeah, it's a promise. It's a promise. That's right. That's right. So two weeks from today, you can get some thoughts together and we'll share it again. In the meantime... We're going back to Romans chapter 6. We actually are. We're just going to go there. And as far as I know, we're just going to stay in Romans 6 for the next few minutes here. Those of you who mark in your Bibles, and I certainly encourage you to do so. Um, somebody, uh, one time in a Bible conference I was teaching about 20 some years ago. Uh, people were warned, oh no, you go to writing in your Bible, you're adding to the Word of God. Give me a break. <laughs> There's nothing holy and sacred about the, the paper from which this book is made. It's the message that's in here telling us about the one true living God and how He set His affection on us and wants a relationship with us. Romans chapter 6, verse 1, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? I'm not going to go back and beat us again about this thing, but American Christianity answers this rhetorical question incorrectly. Paul assumes and probably couldn't imagine churches and preachers teaching folks that, well, the more sin you have, the more of God's grace you get. So, you know, after all, you know, we're just in bondage to sin. Well, let me tell you. That's not where we're to walk. And when he asked this question, the answer was an emphatic no. May it never be, verse 2, how shall we who... Once again, I encourage you, if you haven't underlined it or circled it or marked it, if, you've got, if you're doing the Bible electronically, hopefully you can write a note over there. The key to everything he has to say is this next phrase. Died to sin. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? This is the issue he's contending with here. It should not be a controversial subject. It should be the most fundamental, basic thing that you were taught from the first time you went to Sunday school, the first time you went uh, to a worship service, you should have been taught, this is God's objective for us, that we overcome sin in our lives. By the way, if we had been taught that and had been practicing that, then I wouldn't be agreeing with the world when they say the church is filled with hypocrites. 
Because the churches, instead of gathering together and throwing stones at other churches and other people's beliefs and practices, they would have been focused on how do we become the people God wants us to be. And the problems in here, not the problems out there. But unfortunately, that isn't what happened for most of us in our religious experience. And so the words would have been empty to say the churches are filled with hypocrites. The reality is that the world has a valid accusation, and I remind you again, the first person to use the term hypocrite in reference to religious people was Jesus Christ himself. Hypocrites being play actors, pretenders. And so we're trying to get free from that. Now some people make the mistake of taking this next verse to say that, Magically, mystically, God just sees me as dead to sin because of verse 3, I was baptized. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into His death? Which death is that? This verse is not talking about the death on the cross. This verse is talking about the death that Jesus died every day as He lived His life. That death to the fleshly nature. I'm certain that there were times... When those arrogant, self-righteous, abusive religious leaders were in Jesus' presence, He wanted to punch them in the nose. Because of what they were doing to God's people. But He died to them. And, and when they falsely accused Him and said, Hey, you know, no prophet comes out of Nazareth. He didn't even bother to say to them, Oh, by the way, check the record. I was born in Bethlehem. He wouldn't even do that. He died. And lay down his life. And that's the baptism that we're to be baptized into. Do you know that in the Philippines still, I believe this is true, and Jack, maybe you know since, uh, since your mother was, was Filipino, but I believe that still every year at Easter, there are people who are actually hanged on crosses in the Philippines. I saw an interview probably 20 years ago with a guy who had 18 different times actually been nailed to and hung on a cross. And you see, we look at that and we say, oh, that's how we bear our cross. We die the death Jesus died. It's not talking about the death of Jesus on the cross. The death that we're to die is the death He died prior to that so that it was no problem for Him to follow through and be that living sacrifice to the Lamb of God so that humankind could be saved from themselves and from their sin. It was a death He died many times over before that final day. So how have we been baptized into His death? It's not the baptism that we've been eyewitnesses to here. About this time last year, Denise was baptized here as a demonstration of her faith. That's not the baptism that's being talked about here. The baptism is being submersed in the death to our fleshly nature. My flesh wants to hold grudges against those who've wronged me and my family. My flesh wants to do that. I have to be baptized into the death of Jesus by denying that. Dying to me. And that's why this thing of baptism like John the baptizer did of laying people under the water is a picture of I'm dead, I'm dying to arrogance, pride, lust, greed, uh, jealousy, envy, self-righteousness. I'm dying to those things that my flesh wants to do so that I'm being baptized with Jesus so that I lay down my life for others and consider others as more important than me. That I can bless those who curse me. My wife even has to do that. Can you imagine anybody that would want to impugn my wife? Guess what? They're out there. And what does she have to do? Bless them. Now, I haven't seen her stop on the side of the road to change their tire. But, you know, if your enemy has a flat, stop and help him. Right? See, that's the death that we're dying, allowing Jesus Christ to come alive in us. It's putting Jesus as Lord means, God, what are you up to in this situation? The men have been studying in Genesis and they're reading today about uh, Joseph being lusted after by Potiphar's wife. And when he refused her advances, then she turned the tables and said, oh, he was making advances on me. And boom, he's in jail. Just like that. And you know what? No place in the Scripture talks about Joseph murmuring or complaining. How 
in the world he got such spiritual understanding. Only one way that can happen by the power of the Holy Spirit. Much like uh, Jonathan, when they're in a standoff with the enemies, and his, he was the son of King Saul, and they're in a standoff, and the thousands of the enemies were gathering together against the Israeli army, and they only had two swords, because their enemies wouldn't even let them have a blacksmith. And Jonathan says to his armor bearer, God's not obliged to defeat an army by numbers. He doesn't have to outnumber them. Let's see if he wants to uh, give us victory over these guys. And so he put out a fleece and they attack. And the next thing you know, the Spirit of God moved because of one guy that had that great confidence in God. Where did he get that? He didn't have a Bible like we have. He didn't have the chance to read about the life of Jesus because this is hundreds of years before Jesus Christ physically came. And yet the truths that God has communicated to us out of these pages that we see visually demonstrated in the life of Jesus is what the Holy Spirit's been teaching people that walk with God all through the ages. All through the ages. They were baptized into that death. What death is that? Verse 2. Death to sin. Therefore we then... Buried with him through baptism and in death, that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too would walk in newness of life. Now for those of you that may still be holding on to the idea that you, you know, being baptized like this, or perhaps in the church you grew up in, maybe you were christened as a, as a baby and then you were confirmed later, and you think that means that you're united, united in the death of Jesus? Let me tell you what, that's not it. That's not what he's talking about right here, that we would walk in newness of life, that we'd be raised from the dead. It isn't about your physical baptism. It is about the death that you have to put yourself under as you take dominion over the flesh nature that always wants to exalt itself and ascend. So if you think it was because you got baptized or you took communion, you better put that in here because let me tell you what, there's no place in this book where God ever accepted someone because of some ceremony that they wanted to perform. Amen. It's not there. Go way back to the first time that sacrifices are talked about in the Scripture, and that's Cain and Abel. And see, many of us got the impression that Cain brought the right kind, or excuse me, Abel brought the right kind of sacrifice, that's why it was acceptable, but Cain didn't bring the right kind of sacrifice because he brought the fruit of the ground, and so that's why it wasn't acceptable. I was taught over and over again in various churches that, that Cain needed to have brought a blood sacrifice. And he brought fruit offerings, and so it wasn't acceptable. And you have completely missed the message there. It's not about the offering that they brought. By the way, the law, which later was given and prescribes animal sacrifices, also prescribes grain offerings and first fruit offerings. And so it wasn't about the presentation. Go back and read it. It says, for Cain, his heart, for Cain and for his offering, God didn't have regard. But for Abel... And his offering, God did have regard. See, we focused on the ceremony, and the Bible focused on the heart. You could have flip-flopped it, and Cain could have brought an animal sacrifice, and God would have rejected it. Because it was about the attitude of the heart. Abel, on the other hand, could have brought the exact same sacrifice that Cain brought, and it would have been acceptable because... In his heart, he was seeking God. And his heart was set on God. So religion and teaching of men has convinced us that it's all about the right kind of ceremony. Were you baptized the right way? Are you taking communion the right way? Are you experiencing this in your relationship with God? Are you reading out of the correct translation of the Bible? I'm telling you, it is absolutely asinine the things that religious groups will... Uh, exacerbate as being significant and important like which translation and I think I told you but some of you haven't heard this that I just not too long ago was told about a Baptist pastor in Colorado who told his congregation if you read from any translation except the King James translation of the Bible you are going to hell now that's, a, that's ridiculous 
Because most of the world does not speak English, so that means if they don't read out of the King James, they're going to hell. And then, of course, some have even actually, actually shown their ignorance by saying, if it was good enough for Jesus and John the Baptist, it's good enough for me. There's a little problem there because the King James Bible wasn't published until the, six, to the year 1611. Oops. And Jesus did not speak English. Problem there. But see, that's how absurd it is what religious leaders will do to control the conduct of people in their congregations and also to separate congregations and people from one another. And that's been going on all through the Bible. We, we, you can go back and read. That's exactly what Jesus was contending with with the religious leaders in his day. And so what is this death to sin? Verse 11 says, we've already read this part, even so consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And so some say, oh, see, I just imagine that I'm dead to sin, even though I'm still holding grudges, even though I'm still jealous, even though I still have outbursts of anger. Uh, you know, God doesn't see that. <laughs> you are mistaken. God sees what we do. And we're accountable for what we do. So when he says, consider yourselves dead to sin, this is how you do that. Someone has wronged you. Uh, maybe stolen from you financially. You know, we got involved with a dishonest uh, builder in Oregon. And we lost our house investment years ago. And it was years before we ever had our own place again. And so... I consider myself dead because I'm going to make this right. But you see, if I consider myself dead to sin, I just have to die to that. And I have to command a dishonest man to the Lord and say, God, you deal with it. By the way, there, you may be called upon to punch him in the nose. Do you realize that, see, that's where we need direction from God. But our default position is that we bless those who despitefully use and abuse us. That's what we do. And then especially once things are done and there's no one doing it, then you commend it to God. See, that's how I consider myself dead to sin. Well, you know, I should have had that, that car. We, we were looking at a replacement car. Lynn's, Lynn's car is 10 years old and it's got... About 130,000 miles on now. It's kind of like, yeah, with all these gadgets on these little Cadillacs, you know, it could be some trouble. So we went and we found one that we liked, and they said, okay, you know, here's paperwork. We've got it set aside for you, and lo and behold, they sold it to somebody else. It was exactly, we drove clear across to Peoria because it was exactly the color my wife wanted. Well, I like it too, but so I'm not playing it all. If you think I'm saying it's all about, you know, you girls pay attention to that. No, but none of the guys notice I have a purple tie on, but every woman in here did. I want to know if you noticed my little blue tie tack that's a... That my wife did notice that. Where did that come See, I have stuff she doesn't know about. So here it is, they sold the car to somebody else. They said, oh, well, you know, we've got some others. I'm like talking to you guys. But you know what? See? My flesh says be jealous. This is the car I love. See, my wife driving around in. I won't have to be folded up to get in and out of it like I do the present car. That's her big concern. This has bigger doors. But you see, I consider myself dead to sin. So what do I do? I put jealousy and resentment under my feet. How can I do that? Because I'm such a wonderful guy. <laughs> I've got it all worked out. I'm a spiritual giant. No, it's because of the influence of Jesus in my heart that gives me the power to die to what my flesh is trying out to do. I'm going to go on Facebook and social media and I'm going to tell about this dealership who said they had that car saved for me and they sold it to somebody else right out from underneath me. That's what my flesh wants to do. But I'm such a spiritual I'm not. See, it's the influence of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's the influence of... See, those of you that have the images about preachers being these, you know, super saints, well, I ain't one of them, okay? <laughs> if you haven't figured that out yet, there have been a few folks who figured that out and they decided uh, to take their exit. <laughs> He's just not very dignified up there. Yes, sir, Cliff? No matter what you did, you still wouldn't have the car. <laughs> You're right! Good point! 
So the futility of us taking our own revenge or trying to get even or whatever. Good. Good insight. Spoken by a man who's been a contractor for years. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I like the crew he, uh, that he hires too. I was over at his house this week and you guys are exiting this week, headed back to the cooler climate. Or, so they like, man, they got the kitchen cabinets, they got the countertops. He's going to leave them in the garage. What the heck? Put them in. Oh, he doesn't have another two months to do that right now. And so, you know, his uh, fellow sheetrocker, she's sitting right next to him there. With back problems. With back. <laughs> good insight, though. A good insight. But are we really going to get satisfaction because someone has wronged us, now we're going to hold a grudge against them, and we're really going to get some benefit out of this? You know, it's pretty much irrational. Besides disobedient to God, and God says, oh, you don't want to forgive others? Okay, then you're not going to be forgiven of your sin. That's what Jesus said. If you do not forgive others their sin against you, God cannot forgive you of your sin. So this is a pretty serious exchange that we're into. You know, the one that I hate the most is, is a woman who's been abused by a family member, which tragically has happened way too often. When you don't forgive, not only was the horrible thing done to you, but now you're in bondage to that. And it's like you're dragging this freight train behind you. It doubles down on the problem. I remember sometime, not, not so long ago, 20 years ago or so, TV camera stuck in the face, you know, and the woman breaks down and is weeping and crying because of what had happened to her and how her childhood was wrecked. It's sad. I'm not taking anything away from that. Another woman, they stuck the camera in her face and said, we heard you were abused. What do you think about that? There was no warning. She's like, they opened the front door of her house and, and she says, well, I forgave them and I've gone on with my life. She wasn't dragging the freight train. It doesn't mean what they did is okay. Don't, don't, don't let the enemy twist that around. Don't, no, no, you commend that to God. And my prayer is that that person who did that will repent. Because if they don't, you know the term there's hell to pay? There is literally, according to what the Bible says, God's garbage dump for people who don't repent of deeds like that. Verse 14 tells us then, sin shall not be master over you. For you're not under law, but under grace. And see, I've been accused of not teaching grace. Let me tell you, this is grace. Grace is God's influence here. Now, if you think that, that grace is undeserved favor, you would be mistaken. Because that's mercy. Mercy is favor extended toward us that's undeserved. Grace is the influence of the Holy Spirit of God in our hearts that change and transform us into the people God desires us to be. So sin should not be master over you because of the grace, the influence of the Holy Spirit. But unfortunately, a lot of American Christianity has turned it into Disneyland where you pretend that you're righteous. Oh, God just sees me as righteous even though I'm acting like the devil. Not so. Verse 15, shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? May it never be, not even in 2018. Do you not know that when you present yourself to someone as slaves for obedience, you are the slave or the servant of the one whom you obey? So who are you obeying? Either of sin, which results in death, and he's talking about eternal separation from God here, God's garbage dump, or of obedience resulting in righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus alive and well in you. By the way, to whom is this epistle addressed? It's the book of Romans. It's written not to the atheists in Rome. It's not written to the agnostics in Rome. It's written to the believers in Rome. And he said, hey, believers in Rome, 
You are slaves or servants of the one whom you obey. Who are you obeying? You say, but you know, we're just human. We, we can't overcome sin. That's the whole point of the empowering of the Holy Spirit. We can't do it on our own, but the Holy Spirit gives us the power to do that. The Holy Spirit empowers us to walk like Jesus. Unless we want to live in Disneyland and pretend that it's so when it really isn't. He says your slaves are the one you're obeying. But he says, now look, verse 17, Thanks be to God, though you used to be slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching which you're committed, and having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. So I must be a servant of, a slave of forgiveness. Because that's the guideline to walk with God and live in His kingdom, is that I have to forgive everyone who's wronged me. And my, prayer, my preferred way is when we're praying for somebody, especially if they're sick about healing, is, God, I forgive every person who's ever wronged me. And I bless them and I commend them to you. That, that's how I become a slave of, a servant of forgiveness. Is I actually do that from my heart. I forgive them and commend them to God. Say, well, but wait a minute, wait a minute. I've had people ask me this. Do you forgive people even if they haven't asked for forgiveness? Well, go back and look. Jesus was forgiving those who arranged his murder while he was being murdered. The very guys who were throwing the stones at Stephen to kill him because he spoke the truth and they knew he was right and they couldn't argue with him, so they killed him. And while they were stoning him, he said, God... Don't count this sin against them. I translate that as Stephen saying, God, don't send them to hell for what they are doing to me right now. See, that's how you're a slave or a servant of forgiveness. We used to be slaves to holding grudges. I know some people that they may not have literally had a black book. I've actually met a few people who did. But they spiritually have a black book and they keep record and keep count. And at a moment's notice, they can remember something from 27 and a half years ago. What a miserable place to live. The Lord came to set us free. Free from the consequences of wrong things that were done against us. Free to bless them so we can go on with our lives. We've been freed from sin. We become, verse 18, slaves of righteousness. And he says, I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. But he says, just as you presented your members, your body, uh, uh, as slaves to impurity and lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, now present your members, your mind, your voice, your ears, your hands, your feet, as servants of righteousness, resulting in sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. You didn't do anything that was righteous and pleasing to the Lord. And he says, then what benefit are you deriving from the things of which you're now ashamed? The outcome of those is death. But now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in the sanctification. And guess what the end result of that is? Eternal life. Amen. Oh, no, no, Rick, I, I got eternal life because I got baptized. No, you didn't. I, I got eternal life because I went forward and asked Jesus into my heart. No, you didn't. You started a walk with God. You may have begun a relationship. But you see, the outcome is going to come when we are sanctified, that is set apart and dedicated to forgiveness. That's the order of the day for us. Forgiveness. What if, things that haven't been done to you yet today. Before the day's over, somebody's going to do something to you. I'm, and, I, and I don't have to be a prophet to tell you that. Are you ready in the default position to forgive? It may drop out of the sky. It might be a phone call from somebody. You haven't heard from yours. It, forgiveness is the default position because I'm a slave of forgiveness. And we can apply that to all other kinds of obedient action showing that we're devoted to Jesus. Verse 23 says, The wages of sin is death. The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I've quoted this to many people who are not believers trying to help them come to a relationship with Jesus. And it was only a few years ago that I realized that Romans 6.23 was written to believers. And he says, hey, church people in Rome, 
The wages of sin is death. He would say, hey church at Queen Valley, the wages of sin for you is death. Oh, wait a minute, Rick. I got baptized. I got baptized in your church. I went forward to your church. Doesn't matter. God's not impressed. Well, Rick, you're the one that helped me to pray. Well, you know what? I hope you were praying to God and not to me because on the judgment day, I'm going to be of no help to you. The wages of sin is death to you and to me. So where are you going to walk? And how do we get there? That's what Romans 7 is about. And we can go into that if y'all want to stay the next two hours. <laughs> you bunch of radicals. You're nuts. <laughs> some of us want some of the other kind of food. No, we will uh, We will come back to that in, uh, in the next few weeks here. We're going to get into Romans 7 and into chapter 8. And you're going to see in Romans 7, just a little teaser, he talks about marriage and divorce. And it has nothing to do with physical marriage and divorce. It has to do with our relationship to our flesh nature. We have to learn how to divorce ourselves from our fleshly nature so that we can be born all over again in the image of Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for your word. It is life to us. It is medication to our bones. It's healing to our body. It's a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And God, we're attempting to tuck away the truth of your word into our hearts. And we want to know the whole truth, Lord. We don't want to hide behind the favorite slogans and, and the, the particular verses that in many cases have been taken out of the context of the scripture in which they're spoken and try to give us some false sense that it's okay for us to keep acting like the devil and call ourselves born again spirit filled when we're not. The fruit shows it. And that's what Jesus kept warning his disciples. Not by the ceremonies, not by the buildings, not by the baptism, not by the communion but by the fruit of their life that is seen not on Sunday in a ceremony, but on Monday out in the marketplace and out at work and in the real life that we live. That's the part that proves, Jesus, that we're walking with you is out there. So, Lord, may you draw us into that new life and new birth, overcoming sin, putting it under our feet, to no longer have dominion over us, but instead you, by your Holy Spirit, to have dominion over us. We thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word. My God be, may God be found true, even if every man is a liar. And thank you, Lord, that your word will never pass away. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.